Welcome back, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker. We are very fortunate to have uh, Noah Dagan with us uh, today. Noah is uh, the head of data and AI-driven medicine at uh, the Clalit Research Institute, and she's on the faculty at BGU. Uh, and she uh, has a PhD in computer science and an MD and specializes in public health. And so her work puts together all of these different domains of expertise. And uh, thank you for being here, uh, Noah, and we look forward to hearing Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak in the workshop. Um, so it's it's actually interesting because the, the things I'm going to talk about are really related to topics that were already discussed this morning. Uh, but I think that maybe the difference is that I'll be speaking about them from the perspective of a healthcare organization. Uh, so Clelit is... Uh, a healthcare organization in Israel. We treat over half of the Israeli population. And for the past decade or so, uh, we've been using prediction models pretty uh, ubiquit ubiquitously for many different things and for many different clinical conditions. Uh, and from that experience, we've encountered uh, all sorts of requirements uh, and things that we need to, uh, or standards that we need to uh, live up to when we try to deploy these models in practice. So uh, we will also discuss special considerations uh, of prediction models, specifically in healthcare medicine. And uh, the two things that we will be uh, basically focusing on is fairness and explainability, which are two things that, are, as, as was already discussed this morning, are essential in many domains, but in medicine, they are uh, very important uh, as well. So as a basic outline, we'll start with a few examples of prediction models in medicine, specifically prediction models that we actually use uh, to treat patients in clinical health services. And then we'll talk uh, a bit about uh, fairness considerations, uh, some collaborations that we've had uh, with academic uh, partners regarding these aspects. And finally, we'll uh, discuss some explainability issues and the different trade-offs, again, uh, in a pretty uh, related manner to what was already presented, but from a different point of view, a very practical one, uh, and the different kind of models that we chose uh, to use for different uh, settings uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we'll start with a few examples of, of prediction models in medicine and why they, they are so essential. So this is an article that was published really a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, it really summarizes the need uh, so neatly that I had to, to reference it. Basically, it says that in order for primary care um, practitioners, physicians uh, to do everything that is expected from them by guidelines, they need to, to work almost 27 hours a day. And specifically, uh, 14 hours uh, a day from these 27 hours will be devoted for preventive care. Again, if they want to adhere to every guideline and make sure that every patient in their, what we call in Israel in their list, uh, basically gets everything that they should uh, according the, to the various preventive guidelines. Uh, so it's, I think, obvious to everyone that this is not feasible. And if we try to achieve this um, pursue of these guidelines, the, the, the end, we'll end up with many patients that will not receive what they need to and how we choose the different patients that will or will not receive the preventive guidelines will probably be some um, random process and nothing that is really systematic in any manner. So this is why we think that uh, quantitative models and specifically prediction models in medicine are so essential because basically they allow us to shed a spotlight on a subgroup of patients that are specifically high risk for some clinical condition. 
and we can shed different spotlights like this one for different conditions. So for example, uh, for one disease, it will be one group of patients and for a different disease that we want to prevent, it will be a different group of patients. And that group of patients will be much more uh, targeted and the average risk within that subgroup of patients will be relatively higher to that that exists in the, in the general population hopefully making the interventions, the preventive interventions, both more feasible because the counts will just be smaller. And also probably what we think, and from our experience, it's actually the case, we'll be able to increase adherence to these guidelines because once you tell the physicians uh, or the GPs to focus on a subset of patients in a number that is much more manageable, then there is a much higher chance that they'll actually be able to uh, get to a substantial proportion of, of individuals in that subgroup. So this is why we use spotlights in medicine, and this is why it's so important to us to be able to define those patients at risk for different various future or even current conditions. So as one very practical example that we use on a daily basis uh, in Clelit, Osteoporotic fractures. Uh, I imagine that if I tell most of you that this, this is a condition that we are wor working very hard to prevent, uh, you're wondering why, because there are so many uh, conditions and so many frightening conditions that you may need to be worried about. But not many people think about osteoporotic fractures in that, in that way, and that is just wrong. And our motivation to predict specifically this disease is first that it's a preventable disease. So if we predict the risk, we, we actually uh, can do something about high-risk patients. And the second reason is that this disease is a very high burden disease. Um, the incidence is relatively high. I imagine that everyone in the room knows someone that suffer, suffered an osteoporotic fracture. But the thing that people are less aware of is that the morbidity and mortality of this disease is also very substantial. So for elderly individuals that sustain um, uh, a fracture of the, of the femur neck, the, uh, the thing that is plotted in this diagram, the chance that they will not survive this year is about 20%. And the chance that they will survive the, the year but will stay um, uh, have some limited uh, capacity and they will not just return to the uh, independent independence that they had before the fracture is another 20 or 30 percent. So the amount of individuals that will deteriorate substantially following this kind of fracture uh, is really enormous. And this is something that we really want to prevent. The, these numbers are uh, much higher compared to most types of cancer, for example. So this is something that we really want to prevent. And the, the advantage that we have in this case is that formal guidelines, formal clinical guidelines, recognize the importance of these prediction models specific, specifically for this disease. And this is not the case for almost any other medical condition except for maybe cardiovascular conditions. So this is something that is very feasible. It's very important and we deal with it uh, again on a daily basis. Uh, and I can also say that uh, this is an example of, of, of a paper uh, in which we demonstrate that in order to get to accurate predictions for osteoporotic factors, uh, you can also use uh, CT scans that were done for any other reason. And if, if you integrate the data from the clinical record and the imaging studies, then you can get even better predictions. And this is something that is, again, uh, has a lot of uh, merit in terms of how to treat patients better. So this is one example. A second example that I would give uh, touches on hepatitis C. So hepatitis C is a type of virus, but as opposed to other types of vi uh, viruses that we know, like say COVID-19, this type of uh, virus is, um, once you are infected with it, can become a chronic condition in which the body cannot uh, eliminate the disease. And then over the years, what happens is that the liver can be substantially damaged, uh, causing either uh, cancer of the liver or uh, hepatic failure. Uh, and 
this is something that uh, up until a few years ago uh, was not something that we had very effective way of handling, but starting for, from around um, 2013 uh, and in the years that followed that, we, we started to uh, have in our uh, basket of treatments, treatments that are very effective against this disease, treatments that as opposed to uh, years before that uh, do not have uh, substantial side effects. They, they are given for uh, a course of say 12 weeks uh, it depends on the on the specific type of, of hepatitis C, but uh, let's say for something like 12 weeks uh, and the eradication rates are more than 97%. And that's amazing because up until recent years, uh, the, the treatments that we did have <clears throat> were both very, um, had a lot of side effects and were not uh, so efficient. The, the eradication rate was something like 50%. So this is, uh, an enormous opportunity that we now have and the World Health Organization starts to speak in terms of, of eliminating this disease as a public health threat or as something that is substantial for public health because if we can identify patients that are not uh, known to be active carriers, then we can now treat them and maybe prevent the disease to be passed uh, to other individuals and also save the lives of, of these patients who we identify and treat. <clears throat> the problem is that it, it is estimated that around 50% of those who are infected are undiagnosed. So no one is aware of that fact that they are chronic carriers of hepatitis C, so we cannot treat them. Uh, and when I say no one, I mean both the individual and the healthcare system. So that means that if we want to eradicate this disease, we have to do some sort of screening in order to identify those individuals at risk. And the way we chose um, up until now to do this screening in Clarity Health Services is to start by targeting the individuals that are at the highest risk because we want to maximize the amount of individuals that we identify as earlier as possible so we can actually treat them and hopefully uh, save their lives uh, and prevent those outcomes that I've just mentioned. So uh, you can imagine that the way that we're doing that is to go back in time, uh, recruit a retrospective cohort of patients that were not tested for hepatitis C up until that point in time, and then follow these uh, patients, identify uh, the very small proportion of patients that will end up uh, being positive uh, in the, in the uh, lab tests, and will be uh, uh, relevant for treatment. And then basically take that outcome, uh, cross that with uh, hundreds of, of variables from the medical record. Uh, sometimes we do it with more than hundreds of variables, even thousands of variables. And then we create a prediction model that it helps us to identify patients who are at a specifically high risk for um, hepatitis C. So speaking about explainability and the specific importance of explainability uh, in prediction models in medicine, uh, the first model that we've created in this case was a simple decision tree uh, in order to I, basically create something that policymakers and physicians can relate to, can really understand in a manner that is not just, as was discussed, some post hoc explainability method, but something that is very uh, transparent and can be really readily understood for every uh, patient. And the nice thing about that is that even though this process is done uh, through ML methods, the, the model identifies the same kinds of variables that if, that if you were to ask um, an expert which are the most important risk factors, the first things that are listed in this decision tree will be the factors that that expert will describe. So this is something that is very helpful when we try to convince these uh, physicians and policymakers to adopt these kinds of models because they can really trust when they see that the first things that they see in these decision trees are something that they understand, they can trust the, maybe the, the lower parts of the trees that are sometimes not written in the textbooks that they were taught. And after we get their uh, 
say their trust and uh, we can ask them to do a leap of faith and and go to something that is more black box uh in this case it was an xg boost model and uh something that make the decision uh, more accurate when it's based on many many trees um that ran together to to create a final recommendations for recommendation for each patient and it's also very helpful when we make the performance measures very explainable uh, for policymakers as well. So we just we do, don't just say the AUC is 92%. We try to visualize the, the effect of using such models. So in this, this case, uh, we try to um, visualize the fact that the outcome rate is very, very small. And so it's a very unbalanced pr problem in machine learning uh, lingo. And we try to demonstrate what happens if we focus the screening on a subset of patients, uh, how the overlap between those who are positive and those who are identified by the algorithm for screening is obviously not random, but is uh, um, there's a, a large overlap. And even if we screen only say 6% of the population, we'd be uh, able to identify 72% of the positive carriers. Um, and that means it, so it could be referred to as the recall uh, measure or sensitivity, as we call it in, in medicine. Uh, and that is something that they can really relate to uh, and understand. And uh, I can happily say that uh, that is the case in, in many of the prediction models that we bring to their table and for their uh, decision. Uh, and they really understand the power of these tools and now it's even much more, um, it's much easier for us to, to basically explain these kinds of models. They already uh, gained experience of, of using them, they understand them, uh, and they are eager to adopt them. So we have many of these prediction models in, in production in Clelit, and these models, some of them uh, run on a daily basis, some of them run when they when it's relevant. Say, for example, the uh, allocation of flu vaccines every year for many years now uh, has been uh, assisted by a prediction model. So that runs uh, annually, and other models that you see here on the screen uh, basically run on, on a daily basis. But once we create these models again and we put them into practice, we understand that it's not just something that we can develop, use whatever package that there is out there, get to a reasonable performance measure, measures and just put it into production. When we deploy these kinds of models to, for use specifically in medicine, we have to worry about various things, uh, which are not just the uh, basic performance measures. So the first example that I will give you is something that is from the world of fa uh, fairness. And the organizers of the workshop uh, have asked that I, I'll describe uh, a collaboration that we've had uh, with this respect. Uh, and so here it goes, basically. So fairness is in medicine, I think, I don't even have to say it, but um, uh, just for the good order of things, I will. Fairness in medicine is not something that is related to models. So fairness in, in medicine is, is something that is discussed all the time with respect to um, inequalities or um, access to resources that may be uneven across um, uh, groups in, in society. And fairness is, in medicine is something that is basic. It's something that everyone speaks about completely regardless of models. But when we create prediction models in medicine and we deploy them uh, for medical practice, we have to hold the same standards that uh, the other medical um, professionals and the other uh, aspects of medical domains uh, require in this, in, in this respect. So when we talk about prediction models in medicine and specifically in, uh, regarding fairness, I think that basically the question that we're asking ourselves is, even though we've used the prediction model and we've uh, did a, a much better job compared to the very general guidelines that were used in order to say select patients for preventive um, interventions before the prediction model. So now we are much more 
individualized. We, we identify pa- a subgroup of patients in a much higher risk. So it's obviously much better for the individual patient. But the question is with respect to fairness measure, measures is, is the personalized risk personalized enough? So uh, specifically, if we train a model and we see and we look at the performance measures, we look at the AUC, we look at the different uh, cut of specific uh, performance measures like I don't know, precision or uh, recall or uh, positive predictive value or sensitivity respectively, uh, the different terms in medicine for, for uh, machine learning terms. Basically, we usually look on the average across the entire training set or the test set, whatever we choose to, to evaluate. Usually, we do not take the extra steps of making sure that the performance measures hold when we look at specific minority groups. And the model, when it optimizes whatever optimization function was defined, looks on the average of the population. So it may happen that for minority groups, the predictions will be less accurate or non-accurate. And the question is, what do we mean when we say accurate? What performance measures do we care mostly about? And which performance measures should be tested in subpopulations? And there is no one right answer here. So we have discrimination measures like the AUC or the sensitivity recall for specific cutoffs. We have specificity measures, the positive predictive value, the negative predictive values, uh, all with respect to specific cutoffs. And we also have the calibration measures that not just uh, test the rankings by proportions, but actually make sure that the average predicted rate or uh, risk is correlated to the observed risk. So that the, if we say that the risk is uh, say 15%, then if we take 100 individuals with that average risk, we'll end up having 15 on average patients that actually will have the relevant outcome. So that there is a good correlation between the average predicted risk and the observed risk. And, and again, there's no just one uh, correct measure, but uh, I will, say in a minute which measures we think are more important with respect for prediction models in medicine. So this is not a new problem. In a more simplistic manner, this is something that was brought uh, to medical journals for discussions and with many criticism, uh, criticisms many years ago. So this is an article that is more than nine, 20 years old. And this article basically describes how a specific cohort of patients, which is called the MESA cohort, multi-ethnic study of arteriosclerosis, was recruited in order to develop prediction models for cardiovascular diseases. So in this case, it's, it's, it's simple regression. It's not uh, exibus models and it's not neural networks. It's something that was um, much more simplistic, but was uh, used Use the ubiquitous ubiquitously in cardiovascular um, domains in order to identify patients that are candidates for specific uh, treatments to prevent that cardiovascular disease. And the reason that this uh, MESA cohort was recruited in order to develop um, uh, risk scores was that previous uh, calculators, like the Framingham calculator, which is a fam- very famous prediction model. Uh, in cardiovascular disease in medicine were criticized to be non-accurate for women and for ethnicity groups other than Caucasians. So basically, most of these uh, models were in the beginning uh, developed on cohorts of Caucasian males, and it w- they were criticized that they are not accurate for other groups in the society that are less re- represented. So the way that they chose to uh, address this problem is to recruit a specific cohort in which there is, um, uh, they make sure that they, there is enough representation for the different uh, subpopulations that they want to make sure that the models are accurate for on average. But the problem is that if we have more than one such protected variables, and if we want to uh, protect more variables that as a society we think we need to um, address, then 
pretty soon the number of categories within those features, the protected features that we want to, um, to make sure to test the performance measures with respect to these subpopulations, pretty soon we get to a number of subpopulations that is not feasible for specific recruitment. So we have to use other methods in order to make sure that we create prediction models that are accurate with respect to these subpopulations. So in this collaboration um, uh, with uh, these guys and specifically uh, Guy Rotlum and later Omer Ringold, we basically tried to learn from their experience of studying these problems in a theoretical manner and creating algorithms for multi-calibration in order to, to make sure that the models are calibrated with, res with respect to different subpopulations in the training set simultaneously. So why did we choose to focus on this specific work and specifically on calibration measures? And the answer is that in medicine, many of the guidelines, when they uh, take prediction models or predicted risk into account, what they refer to is the absolute risk. That means that they usually set a specific cutoff and say that if the predicted risk is over uh, some percentage, say 7.5% in cardiovascular conditions for the decision of whether or not to treat the patient with statins, for example, that's a drug that is used to reduce cholesterol levels, then the guidelines say, or the guidelines refer to the absolute risk. And if that absolute risk is being predicted accurately and, and, and say for that patient, uh, the risk is indeed 99.3% and the, and the model identified that uh, risk accurately, then for that patient, the decision, the medical decision of whether or not to start statins as a treatment will be the correct decision. But if we have a patient from a minority group that was less represented in the training set, and for that minority group, the, the predictor is not accurate and say that the predictor identified, identifies the, the risk of the patient as 6.4%, and that's not the correct uh, actual uh, risk of that patient, then we may choose the wrong pathway for the treatment of that patient. So this, this is why we really care about absolute risks, uh, specifically in medicine. And this is why we care about model calibration. So in order to really make sure that indeed there is a problem that we need to fix and we're just not pursuing something that is not really a problem, we went back to the world of cardiovascular predictions and specifically to a predictor which is called the pooled cohort equations. That's like the modern version of the Framingham score that I've des uh, described. And we took a population of Clalit members, over 1 million of them, which are relevant with regards to the inclusion and exclusion criteria for that predictor. And you see the different predictors that are used to predict that risk. And you see the, protected, the specific protected features that we've chosen to uh, evaluate different performance measures with respect to these subpopulations. And the first thing we found out that after a very simplistic adjustment to Israeli rates of cardiovascular outcomes, the model is very well calibrated. You see, it sits on the diagonal of the plot uh, that with respect to the predicted versus observed risk. And usually, honestly, we stopped here. We said, okay, this, this looks good. Uh, the plot seems good. The, 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 the quantitative measures are close to one, uh, which means that we have good calibration. We should be satisfied and maybe feel comfortable deploying this model into production. But the thing is that once you go into those hundreds of subpopulations that can be defined by those five protected features that we um, uh, that we saw in the previous slide, then what we see is that for the average, it is well calibrated. But when you look at specific subpopulations, 20% of them ha actually have a calibration in large values that are smaller than 0.8. And another 20% have calibration in the large values of more than 
1.5, that means that very large number, a very large number of groups, of subpopulations that we've defined by those protected features get very um, inaccurate results, very uncalibrated results. And that is something that is, is, is not good, obviously. Uh, and in a different way of plotting this, uh, here we've plotted each such subgroup as a different dot on the x-axis. And, and here the, 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 the y-axis is in the log scale. So here, perfect calibration is zero. And you can see that many, many subpopulations are, have very poor calibration with the largest population, which is the entire population on the left, and the smaller subpopulation on the right. So it, it, the, you, you see some trend uh, in which when the subpopulation is smaller, the calibration measures are as expected, even worse. Um, and in this case, we took the algorithm that was suggested by Heber Johnson et al, and we've implemented it. So this algorithm is basically a post-process algorithm uh, that does something that is uh, um, very simple. I think it's beautiful how simple it is. It basically iterates through the different subpopulations. And as long as there is a subpopulation in which the, um, the average of the prediction is uh, uh, um, far enough from the um, observed rate of the disease in that subpopulation, then the algorithm, which is a post-processing algorithm, basically nudges the predictions of that subpopulation with respect to the difference that we've observed. And they have um, um, nice proofs in, in, in these publications of why uh, this basically um, will stop running at some point. Uh, and every subpopulation in the, um, in the training set will be uh, calibrated below that threshold of tolerance that we've defined. Um, and that's, that's, not, um, that's not obvious because many individuals simultaneously are simultaneously defined by different subpopulations. So for a specific individual, it can be the case that in different iterations of the loop, they will be um, shifted with the predictions back and forth until they settle on a specific prediction that satisfy this, this um, condition for the entire subpopulations that they belong to simultaneously. And uh, honestly, uh, being the, the practical people who implement these things, when we saw this uh, academic uh, theoretical algorithm, we were pretty skeptical that, actually, that it will actually converge and actually finish running, and that it will actually manage to do what it promises to do. And we were really amazed by these results in which the calibration in the test set was much, much better for all subpopulations after running this algorithm. So this is uh, in a density plot of the different subgroups um, of patients that are defined but with those uh, variables. And this is the different, uh, the, the second plot that, that we've saw. Um, we call it in medicine, it looks like an EEG an abnormal EEG, but we call it an EEG plot. So uh, everything was much better uh, with respect to this plot as well. So, and, and if we wanted in a quantitative manner, the variance of the calibration in the large values between the subpopulation was actually reduced by 90, more than 99%. And for us, it was amazing. And this is something that uh, if you want to read more about, you can, you can find it here. This is something that we are actually implementing these days as part of the um, uh, ML, automatic ML processes that we have in order to create prediction models in Talit. This is now integrated as a post-processing step to every prediction model that we uh, will create in the future. So this is an example of how um, academia meets practical needs and uh, does so in a manner that is very practical and actually affects patients' lives. Uh, so for us, it was an amazing uh, collaboration and, and we're very fortunate to, uh, to be encountered, uh, to meet those people and to uh, become part of that um, community that, that tries to think about fairness with respect to prediction models in medicine.
Uh, the third topic that I will discuss. A, a question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, sorry. I maybe missed this. Where did the subgroups come from? Like domain knowledge, uh, physicians observing miscalibration. Like, how did you decide these sensitive attributes to uh, then uh, plug into multi calibration? So th this is a good, good question and an interesting one. So this is uh, this was defined by by social values. If if you mean these are the the features that people think about when they talk about minority groups. But if you ask me as a clinician, what I'm really interested in now uh, is to try these things out, not just for these protected features that society defines as protected features. I want to also try these out for clinical features uh, to test whether the prediction is accurate for a minority groups, which is a clinical minority group. Uh, and this is something that we plan to do. By the way, their, their, um, uh, their paper and their algorithm is reading in a manner that is oblivious to the to the set of, of groups and to how you define those groups. Uh, it can be done by any set of subgroups uh, within that uh, that can be defined by features in the subset that the individual set that you have. But for us, in this first uh, run of this reel was uh, a so like society uh, considered features and in. Future, in the future, I think it will do the same for clinical features and see what that does to the model. Thanks. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, you're going to come to explainability next, but I was already wondering whether this uh, post-processing step, uh, you know, uh, possibly worsens what the uh, what the decision tree might look like. So are you just changing the probabilities and beliefs of the decision tree or are you making bigger changes? And is that something that's taken into consideration? So that's a really, really great question. Um, basically what happens behind the scenes is, is what I said is, is that predictions are being moved back and forth. Uh, so it can definitely affect things and it can definitely affect things like explainability. But the question is because it basically, it changes the algorithm, uh, but it, it depends on how you treat explainability. So for us, in many cases, what we do when it's a black box model, we do a very uh, simplistic explainability in which we describe the risk factors that are um, mostly understood by physicians that are relevant for each uh, patient. And usually for each patient, we have at least one, two, three major risk factors. If that patient was indeed identified as a very high risk, usually uh, he or she have enough major risk factors so that the clinician will feel comfortable with identifying that patient as a high risk patient. But that doesn't mean that the physician completely understand the, the process uh, in, a transmer in a a completely transparent fashion. Uh, and that actually um, connects really nicely to the next part of the of the presentation in which I will claim that the models should always be explainable to an extent that the physician should be should feel comfortable with the decision. But the way that the models are being used and the purpose for which they were developed, changes the amount of transparency that the model needs to have. So I will go to the next part and I hope that you will understand what I mean by that. So, in, and, and understand why in some uh, circumstances, it's okay just to describe several risk factors that are relevant for the patient, just so the clinician will have uh, uh, an ability to, to make uh, a relevant discussion with the patient and, and explain why we think that he or she are at a specifically high risk, and why in other cases the process needs to, to be completely transparent and then maybe uh, messing with the predictions in that manner uh, is something that will be more challenging. So I think it's clear, and I, I don't need to uh, uh, overstate why uh, prediction models in medicine need to be explainable. We have, um, decisions that could affect patients' lives, and we don't want to do it uh, in a completely black box fashion. Uh, but to what extent? It depends on the actual um, use of the model. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. And I will try to explain it to you by uh, 
uh, walking you through our experience during the COVID-19 pandemic, because things that I'm saying now is things that we've learned uh, during the last two, three years. And I don't think that three years ago, I would have been able to, um, I, I don't think I would have uh, told you the same things, but during the COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, we use prediction models for more resource allocation that we've, than we've ever used before. And during that, um, the different phases of the pandemic, we understood that we need different models for different types of users. So um, when we talk about prediction models, again, we have that trade-off of, of accuracy and, and, and maybe explosivity uh, uh, in which complex and explosive models usually have better performance. Usually they have more uh, granularity, so they have more and larger number of potential intervention risk cutoffs. But usually they are, are less explainable, if, even if we can, as I say, um, state a few risk factors that are relevant for each patient, it's never a completely transparent um, process. And it could affect the trust or, or acceptance that different physicians have towards these models. On the other end of the spectrum, we have very simple models like regressions, for example, or decision trees, uh, in which the performance is usually lower. The number of potential intervention cutoffs are sometimes, depending on the model, can also be smaller, but the explainability uh, is higher and the trust and acceptance is also usually higher. And, and uh, I'll give you three different examples on this spectrum, all relevant to prediction uh, models and specifically to the prediction of uh, the risk of being a, uh, a patient that has a severe disease once you will be affected by the, uh, the uh, infected by the virus. So we are talking about uh, severity risk prediction and during the pandemic, the need for these um, risk predictions usually uh, basically changed uh, for the different resources that we needed to allocate. So the first use case that we had was in the very first weeks of, an, of the pandemic. Uh, and in Israel, those were the very first weeks in which we had patients. And the policymakers in Kalit requested that we create a tool that will um, basically identify high-risk patients and will create stratification of the Kalit population so they will be able to uh, do some interventions that we'll see in a few slides. The, the challenge was that, uh, and this is not, that the, it's, it's not related specifically to explainability, but it's just interesting and it's related to the previous part of the talk. So uh, the, the challenge was that we didn't have individual level data regarding COVID-19 yet in Israel. So what we did is to create a prediction model based on that flu predictor that I've told you about that we run in, in every winter because we thought that it's reasonable to assume that another infectious disease that affects the, uh, the, the lung, the pulmonary uh, functions, could share the same risk factors as that, this new disease that we know almost nothing about. And we created this um, flu predictor, basically. It wasn't exactly flu. It was adjusted to be any serious infectious disease that is a, a, a respir respiratory uh, infectious disease that requ required hospitalization. And we identified the predictor, so this is uh, shock values, and we identified the predictor that seemed uh, clinically very reasonable. It identified risk factors like age and smoking, cardiovascular disease, albumin, which is a major protein um, that, that tells us something about the frailty of the person. Everything seemed uh, very reasonable, and we had this very granular uh, model that ranks the population with re their respect to uh, encounter a severe respiratory infection. But it wasn't the COVID-19 predictor in any way, but what we did have in those days were epidemiological uh, case fatality rates from the Ch Chinese CDC. And we really wanted to uh, take these numbers into consideration because uh, these numbers told us, for example, that the disease is more severe for males and the disease is much more severe for older individuals compared to younger individuals in the manner that is not uh, in this, like the same slope like other respiratory conditions. 
So we really want to adjust the model, the individual level data model for the um, respiratory infection to these new epidemiological level data um, observations from different countries. <clears throat> and the interesting thing about it is that the way we, that we chose to do it is using the same multi-calibration algorithm that we already used for furnace considerations before the pandemic for completely different outcomes. So here it was not for fairness um, uh, reasons. It was just in order to shift the prediction in a multi uh, in a, in a post-processing manner uh, in a way that will accommodate different uh, targets averages uh, because a specific individual, for example, can belong uh, simultaneously to different age groups, sex groups, and chronic condition groups. Uh, so we use that multi-calibration outcome to adjust that model to every piece of information that we could put our hands on as of those days. And that was basically the first predictor that we created for severe COVID-19. Uh, and have COVID-19 data and individual level data uh, in Israel uh, uh, seemed to be doing a pretty good work. It was a black box model. All those shiftings uh, did it completely something weird that we've created because we had to to use something uh, uh, at, at that time. But uh, retrospectively, we saw that, for example, it identified a very high risk group of only 8% of the population, but that 8% of individuals actually identified 73% of those that ended up deteriorating. Uh, and we had several such uh, certification groups. So I'm, I'm doing it a bit uh, quickly so we can uh, get to the end of the presentation, but Basically, the, just trust me that the prediction model had pretty good performance measures, and specifically the calibration, uh, which was pretty nice. Uh, so the baseline predictor for the respiratory infection, you, you see it in purple, and you see the calibration of the predictor after uh, the process uh, of using those um, uh, Chinese measurements of case fatality rate, and you can see that it's not very a very good calibration, but uh, if you take into account the process that we did here, which we did not know if we, it will work or not, it was a really reasonable uh, calibration uh, for the type of process that we created. And this model did a lot of heavy lifting. We used it for many, many different uh, things during the, the first months of the pandemic. In the very first weeks, 200,000 elite members received personal phone calls from their clinics uh, telling them that they are at a high risk for this, this new disease, how they should uh, watch themselves, how they should contact the clinics if they need something so they will not have to leave their house and go to um, a clinical facility that may have uh, people that could infect them. Uh, once someone was already infected, we use this prediction model in order to, as a safety net, uh, to um, hospitalized patients that seem clinically well, even though um, uh, even though they seem clinically well, uh, we identify high risk uh, populations as candidates for hospitalization because the deterioration rates for that very high risk group were more than thirty percent. So they it was very very high risk, and we consider them as candidates to be uh, placed in the hospital just to make sure as a safety net. Uh, in that case, and the, even if they were treated at home because they are at a, a lower tier of risk, then they would be contacted more times a day according to the protocols compared to other patients that were at a lower predicted risk. Um, and so this is the first use case in which we had a very expressive model. It was a black box model. You can read more about this. And the thing about this model is that none of the resources that we have allocated was super sensitive because if a physician wanted to contact the, the patient and, and tell them that they were at high risk because they think they thought that the model missed that patient, they would just pick up the phone and call them. Uh, it was not a, it was a, um, a limited resource, but not in the sense that if a physician wanted to assign that resource to an extra patient, someone will care about it. Same goes for the hospital bed. So the resource was limited, but not in a dramatically fashion that, that was um, uh, very um, tightly monitored, let's say it like that. 
And in that case, a black box model in which we just state some risk factors for each patient, just to make sure that the physicians understand why that patient was at a high risk, that was good enough. But then a few uh, months later, in the middle of 2020, it was in Israel, it was the end of the first lockdown. And then there was new need for a risk certification tool for the use of the general public. People wanted to know whether or not they were at a specifically high risk, whether they can return to their jobs, whether they can feel uh, safe to leave their house or meet their grandchildren or whatever. And then we were asked to create a prediction model that could be used by the general public. So it has to be very, 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 very simple model that anyone can just use. And you do not need, uh, I don't know, a Linux server with um, 40 um, processors and whatever in order to run the, the model. Um, and here what we did is to create a very simple model in which we created the training set and the temporal test set, but we've identified the major risk factors that were known as risk factors as of then for severe COVID-19. And we, by definition, said that each such risk factor will be alluded uh, one single risk point for each risk factor. And then we did a lot of um, not very machine learning process uh, in which we basically explored the various risk on the, the average predicted risk within different cutoffs of, of age groups and age groups and number of risk points and the um, uh, basically the interaction between these factors. And then we manually created cutoffs that I defined or, or uh, stratified the population into different risk groups. And we've created plots uh, that stated that, for example, if you are uh, over the age of 70 and you have more than four points, risk points, then you are at a very high risk. And if you are in different age groups, then it depends on the amount of risk points that you have. And then we've, we've been able to stratify the population in a very simplistic manner into various risk um, uh, groups. And each risk group, uh, it, when, when you test this very simplistic uh, process in a temporal test set, uh, you can see that it works pretty well, surprisingly well compared to the uh, simplicity of the process. And then we've been able to really translate every risk group into specific recommendations taking into account the dissemination rate uh, in the local setting as of that time and the specific activity, uh, whether it's low uh, risk activity or high risk activity. And then this was a very simplified decision support to empower different individuals to make the decisions for themselves. And this is in Hebrew, but this is how it was published in the popular media in Israel so that every individual can identify the risk factors and basically place themselves in the risk uh, group. So this is, in terms of explainability, something that is in the uh, spectrum of very, very simple, something that can be used, used by the general public, extremely transparent, but has very low granularity and, and accuracy is reasonable, but, but obviously not something that um, we can do when we want to allocate resource in a, in a more granular fashion. And then came the beginning of 2022, in which we had new COVID-19 treatments. It's not the vaccinations, it's the, treat it's the treatments that you give patients once they were already infected. And on a daily basis, we had the need to allocate these medic medications to the highest risk patients. So this is something that has to be fully transparent because now you, you are allocating something that is, in a, in, is, is really limited resource. And you cannot just choose to give it to extra patients. If you want to give it to extra patients, you have to have a very good reason. Uh, and, and on the other hand, you need to create enough granularity to accommodate the different uh, levels of the pandemic and the amount of uh, medications you, that you have each day. So uh, we understood that the black mo box model cannot work in this case. Uh, and this very simplistic model is not suitable either. So we basically created something in the middle. 
what we created is a logistic regression model for severe disease. And then we took the, uh, the row coefficients and translated them in a linear transformation manner into points of risk. And what we came up with is another uh, method of risk points. So it's completely transparent. It could be manually calculated, but it's not something that could be presented to the gen general public in a manner that uh, individuals can just see it in the news and, and calculate the risk in their head. Uh, it's something that is more suitable for the use of physicians. And you can see the number of risk points that are uh, assigned to each risk factors. And you can also see that uh, now after the era of vaccines, we also have protective factors that have negative uh, points that can decrease the predicted risk. And this provided us with very high granularity, more than 100 different cutoffs. This is just one uh, part of it. And we could tell the policymakers, listen, depending on the amount of resources you, you have in each day, say this day you are uh, giving the drugs uh, to people with 55 points of risk and above. So this will be correlated to 1% of the population, but this, the sensitivity, the recall will be 36%, and the positive predictive value of the precision will be 12%. Now you can allocate the drugs and or the pandemic levels are lower. You can allocate the drugs to 10% of the, of the infected individuals every day. So now you can use the cutoff of 39 points, and this is the performance measures that you will get in return. So this is something that is granular. It can accommodate different levels of the pandemic and different allocation of numbers of, of peers that you can assign to patients every day. But uh, it's completely transparent and it allows manual re-estimation in cases that the physician say, listen, you've missed something. I know that this patient has COPD. You do not know that because the data was not accurate enough. So now I know how to adjust the uh, calculated probability that ran over the night and to understand that this uh, patient is now eligible to receive that treatment. Uh, so this is like a trade-off between the simplicity and expressivity between the transparency and accuracy. Uh, the performance measures, as you saw, are pretty good, uh, but it allowed us uh, to create something that could be used by physicians for the allocation of a scarce resource that was very sensitive. The allocation was very sensitive and thus had to be completely transparent. We could just not say this patient uh, is not uh, eligible for the disease without completely explaining why. So it's not like uh, opt-in, like the first model, these patients are at high risk, call them, send them to hospitals. But if you want the same for other uh, patients, that, that's okay. In this case, some patients, it's like opt out. Some patients, because of the model, were, did not receive resources that they wanted, and it had to be completely transparent and um, completely clinical. So this is like a, a summary of the different uh, types of models, the different uses, and depending on the type of resource and depending on the sensitivity of the use of that resource, uh, the, it, it was very correlated to the amount of explainability and transparency that we had to create when transparency uh, had to come to a point in which manual cal calculation was also an option in some of the cases. Um, and now if we talk about academic collaborations and potential uh, questions that we, we want answers for is uh, can we create expressive models that are also explainable and, and there, is there a way to overcome this trade-off? And actually, um, we now have a collaboration with a group um, in Berkeley, actually, uh, trying to use their uh, processes in order to make uh, more expressive models to be more explainable as well. Um, I think I will skip this part, just say that everything I've just talked about uh, is used in practice. It, it looks like this is or the, the interfaces in which physicians receive these recommendations. Uh, they see a different intervention list for this case, COVID-19. You can see the severity ranks and what we call proactive focus. So this is very correlated to the fairness question of how you uh, identify the risk and how you rank the patient in a fashion that is fair. And once the person, the, the physician wants to know why someone is at specifically high predicted risk, uh, they can press this question mark and then Basically, what they see is a, a pop-up window with the explainability of the model. And again, depends on the type of model. 
uh, the type of explainability that we will describe. Uh, and I will skip these parts that describe not just who are the patients at high risk, but also how to treat them better and how to narrow uh, treatment gaps for them. Um, so as just a quick summary, we, we discussed uh, why prediction models are important in medicine. We saw some examples for prediction models in medicine, and we saw how we try to accommodate both model fairness and sustainability in very practical medical use cases. So I think with this, uh, I will stop sharing my screen. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I think we can maybe accommodate one quick question. Yeah. Hello, Noah. Herschel Cummings here. Um, so, so when you talked, well, well, well like, was the first amazing talk. I'm like, you no, know, totally impressed at all of this, like, you know, impact of like, you no, know, translating theory into practice. But I think. I think for like time, I will hurry along. Um, um, so while you talked about these like you know COVID risks of like you know low risk, high risk, very very high, I was sort of um, struck with a question that I feel like as academics we are often faced with, which is which is there's like a trade off between like precision and recall, um, and and I really liked how you were able to say, here are these like, you know, three separate groups, very high, high and low. Um, and for each of those, you can like, you know, characterize various objectives. Um, and I imagine in your case, because you had like, because you had like, you know, concrete interventions and you can treat these groups differently as kind of like actionable information. Um, 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 how would you suggest people go about making those decisions or kind of thinking about how do you take this like trade-off information um, when they're faced with less like, like, like you know, concrete tasks as a result of that? So um, it's really interesting that you specifically mentioned uh, recall and, uh, and precision and a trade-off between them because usually when I talk to policymakers and I'm a physician but I talk to physicians that are responsible not just for, to develop this type of solutions but to actually make decisions for patient care, usually these are the two measures that are most intuitive for them. So we basically uh, present them with these kinds of tables and uh, sometimes as I, as I showed in a graphical manner, listen, this is the trade-off. If we uh, choose this cutoff, we we'll identify X percent of the patients at, as high risk. So we need to have resources for X percent of the patients. And then the trade-off will be, we'll identify, I don't know, Y percent of uh, the patients that are actually at risk. This is the sensitivity or the recall. And for each patient, uh, what we'll have is a precision or a positive predictive value of, I don't know, Z percent. And uh, it depends on, on, on the trade-off because Sometimes the, the, the intervention is something that um, is nothing but good. So even if you have a low precision, it, it's, 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 it's not, um, uh, you don't care about that. Sometimes the intervention could be something that is more substantial, something that has trade-off, harm benefit trade-off, and you want to have a positive predictive value or a precision that is uh, high enough and, and um, justifies that. So basically, when we create these tables or these graphs and present them to the policymakers with respect to the specific clinical question, they can do uh, the clinical math of what is more important to not miss patients or to not identify false positives. Uh, and that's basically what they do. And these are actually the two performance measures that are most intuitive for them, uh, as opposed to, say, specificity and negative predictive value. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think with this, uh, let's thank Noah again. And now we'll break for lunch and we'll be back at 2 p.m. Bye everyone, thank you.